you could open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 14, chapter 14. We are launching today on a series that we've entitled Anticipate God. We thought it would be a good way to anticipate the coming new year, and really, it would be a good time at any time, to study the topic of the might and power and greatness of our God. And so, contrary to our normal practice, we're not going to be going through a single book over the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at passages of Scripture that in a particular way highlight the greatness and the power of our God and that are intended to build the faith of His people. And our prayer is that these passages would build our faith as well. The author A.W. Tozer, probably one of his most memorable and repeated quotes, said this, What comes into our minds... When we think about God, is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God Himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but the company of Christians that composes the church. Always, the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us, more important than our practical skills, more important than our resume, more important even than our family or marriage health. This is the most fundamental truth, more important than all other accomplishments or self-proclaimed identities, is this idea. What do we think about God? Well, the design of this series and these passages is to elevate and exalt our view of God to match as closely as possible the reality. It's to help us think about God the way He really is, the God who is, as the theologians have said, that it would shake us out of our normal expectations of Him in our private or our Sunday gatherings. Our prayer is that our view of God as He truly is will shape our anticipation of our Sunday morning meetings since we gather first and foremost to encounter God as His people to receive from His Word, and to know Him by His Spirit is the purpose for this gathering, fundamentally. I pray that we will also anticipate God when we leave this place, especially as we consider our calling to witness to our God in the world. I pray that there will be no sense of tame Christianity or a tame, predictable God in the minds of our members. Or in the corners of our souls. I pray that when we wake in the morning, we would be anticipating God, God as He is, the God of unrivaled power, the God of sovereign salvation, the God of inescapable judgment, that this God would fill our minds because I see in my own heart, and I'm sure you do in yours, there is a tendency to shrink God to the size of our own preferences. And the Word intends to expand God in our minds to the size of His true transcendence. So our desire is that we want 
to be a church who exercises faith in the glory and power of our God as defined by his word, that we would tremble in holy reverence and fear and that we would exult and exercise faith because of his greatness, that we would believe in the absolute power of God in salvation and judgment. And that that picture of him would shape us on Sundays and every day. This passage is perhaps the most profound expression of exalting God in the Old Testament. It is part of a section of Scripture that is repeatedly referenced as the greatest Old Testament example of God's salvation and judgment. It is the story of Exodus. And the final concluding contest of that story between God and Pharaoh where he is redeeming his people out of Egypt and bringing them towards his promised land. And this is the the final contest of whether God will be shown as supreme or whether this false god Pharaoh and his false trust in his gods will ultimately triumph. That's the point of Exodus 14. What will happen to this people that have been rescued out of slavery, where God has shown his great power by plagues that have trounced the Egyptian strength? What will happen to this people that is now wandering in the wilderness? What will happen to them? How will God work on their behalf? Is God as great as he has proclaimed himself to be? That's the question that Exodus 14 raises. So what I want to do this morning is, is walk through the story one section at a time and comment as we go, and then we'll use the latter half of the message to proclaim its truth to us. Let's pray just for a moment and ask the Lord to bless us as we read his word. Lord, we're about to read your word, which is true. This event took place. This picture of your power and glory took place. And therefore, it should change us. You are the same God now that you were then. You have not changed. You've only added more events to reveal your greatness. So change us this morning. Change me by the reading of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's dive in. You can essentially divide this story, the crossing of the Red Sea story, into two major parts and one conclusion. So the first part I might label God's plans, just to give us a narrative peg uh, to hang on the opening section of this story. God's plans and then God's power might be the second part. And the final conclusion we might label God's people. Let's begin looking at this opening section. We'll walk through it uh, sort of one couple of paragraphs at a time. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Haharoth between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall camp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped by the sea by pi Haharoth in front of Baal, Zephon. This chapter picks up the Exodus story, as many of you would know, after God has decimated Egypt by ten plagues. Each time Moses would go to Pharaoh and declare, Israel is my people, let my people go. And each time Pharaoh would say, no, I will not. 
Who is the Lord, Pharaoh declared? Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let God's people go? The question of who God is is central to the plagues and the contest at the beginning of Exodus. Who is the Lord? Who is this God who declares himself to be creator of the heavens and the earth, who declares himself to be the redeemer of these people that belong to the king of Egypt? Who is this God is the question, and that question was decisively answered in plague after plague after plague. When the power of Egypt was decimated, they were brought to their knees, and finally, contrary to their forgetfulness, beginning in verse 5, they were forced to let God's people go. That's the context of the Lord saying to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and camp in front of of the sea. This is perplexing. This is a perplexing strategy. He's just delivered them. They're headed east out of the land of Egypt, but he tells them, I want you to circle around and I want you to camp right in front of this Red Sea where you are essentially trapped from a military standpoint. There is nothing between you and Pharaoh but desert, and there's nothing behind you. There's no way you can go but the sea. They, they have you right where they want you, and that's right where I want him. The point of this kind of divine narration, when we get this point in the story, the the Bible writers want us to know, look, God is seeing what is actually happening contrary to the people in the events themselves. Pharaoh didn't receive this news from God. Uh, Pharaoh is just hearing reports that these slaves that he had recently let go after the death of all the firstborn sons of Egypt, that they are for some strange, perplexing reason, wandering back and now camped out in front of the sea. You have to imagine the condescension and confidence that came to Pharaoh's mind in court, which we read in verse 5. When they begin to look at this wandering slave gathering and they say, well, why did we let these people go? Clearly, they don't know what they're doing, and we have them surrounded. They're trapped by the sea. They are wandering in the desert. The desert has hemmed them in. They don't know where to go. Let's go take them back. And yet we see, having read the opening paragraph, that in fact, the Lord is the one who is ordaining this whole thing. It is God's plan that will come about. It is God's plan that will be accomplished. And we want to notice with sobriety, verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. It's a repetition of verse 4, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. This is a couple of verses that are uncomfortable for us. It's one of those verses that we might tend to ignore or explain away that we must not do. They are in the Scriptures. When God declared in Genesis that sin would result in death, there was no promise of elongated life. That was a surprise. So anything else that God does, according to the biblical perspective, is entirely God's right to do. And if God decides to give Pharaoh precisely what he wants and to harden him in his determination to defy God, that is exactly the kind of judgment that God is allowed to exercise towards someone who is defying him. This is terrifying for anyone who assumes that at a later time in their life they will surely humble themselves before God, but right now in their life they would prefer to have fun and enjoy their own pleasures. This is terrifying because it indicates that at any moment God might choose to no longer give you the opportunity to soften your heart towards Him. That's exactly what happened to Pharaoh. It's sobering. It's terrifying. It should be sobering for anybody that's grown up in the church. For young people in the church, because Pharaoh literally came to the point in his life where he was so defiant of God that God actually amplified his hatred of God in order to position him for judgment. So if you're a young person growing up in the church, take a lesson from Pharaoh and realize it is extremely foolish to assume that you will humble yourself later if you don't wish to do so right now. God may not allow you to do so later, and you won't know the difference because you won't want to later either. God has this plan. Apparently, in the wisdom of God, it is necessary for his enemies to know that he is the Lord. Apparently, in the cosmic 
universal angelic realm of heaven. It is necessary for the glory of God to be vindicated, not only for his people, but for his enemies to know that he is the Lord, unrivaled, uncontested, and supreme over all other powers. Do you notice that in the passage? Who is it that's going to know that he is the Lord? It's the Egyptians. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And we see this throughout the pages of Scripture. And apparently, it is necessary in God's world, even for his enemies, to be made aware of his supremacy. This is not any different from what we see in Philippians chapter 2, where it declares that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's just a repetition of this same passage. Even his enemies will know that he is supreme and defying him and setting oneself up as a God the way Pharaoh did will ultimately lead to devastation. And not only devastation, but the knowledge of God's supremacy. God's plan is that he will finally answer answer Pharaoh's question once and for all. Who is the Lord, Pharaoh asked, that I should let God's people go? God says, I will show you who I am. God's plan is unfolding, and yet we also want to notice that God's plan is initially concealed, as it often is. We don't get the impression that the Israelite people know. We definitely don't get the impression that the Egyptians knew. They are simply wandering in the desert. And so when this army comes charging towards them with their back to the sea, no way to escape, and their former masters with all of their overwhelming military might rushing down on them, that's where we pick up in verse 10. Let's continue reading. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, And they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff. And stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And here we have it again. I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and all his host, of the Egyptians rather, so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. God's plans for his glory are not immediately apparent to his people. What they are aware of is the physical, visual reality of, (laughs) what's the number? 600 chariots. Now, we have to remember, back then a chariot is similar to a tank in our modern era of warfare. Psychologically for them, this was the impossible, devastating, inexorable power of earth coming to either crush or re-enslave them. Their expectation, apparently, is that Pharaoh is going to kill them. I think it's more likely that Pharaoh is going to capture them as to his design and bring them back into slavery. But in any case, as they are looking at this chariot host, this army on horseback, rushing towards them, they have only one expectation. Death. What they can see before them indicates they are powerless, they are hopeless, and actually God has led them into this position. God has brought them to the place where their former master doesn't just want to enslave them, he apparently wants to kill them, and so they cry out to Moses, isn't this what we said? We'd rather be slaves and alive than free and dead. Why did you bring us here, Moses? Moses, why did you do this? You notice how quickly God's people can forget the evidence of his power. 
They had just watched Egypt brought to their knees. Their crops were ruined. Their livestock were dead. The firstborn of all of their houses were killed. They were led out with exultation, plundering the Egyptians along the way. And yet, just a short time later, they are saying, why did you take us out of Egypt? It would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Listen, doubt is the ever-present enemy of God's people. It is the ever-present reality that God's people are facing on a day-to-day basis, especially when God's plan is concealed to them. When they are in the wilderness, it seems as though the only outcome is their own destruction, and it requires a An unusual ability to see what cannot be seen, to trust what cannot be seen, to exercise faith in that moment. Now, we know that this is all unfolding according to God's plan, that apart from them feeling this weakness, God would not be able to achieve the glory that would bring him exclusive praise for trouncing Pharaoh. But all they see is their weakness and vulnerability. Pharaoh is coming. But Moses, as God's representative, declares, do not be afraid. God will fight for you. He will show you his salvation. You will never see these Egyptians again. Pharaoh believes, Moses rather, believes in the impossible. You are never going to see these Egyptians again. You won't even have to fight. Actually, the final phrase there, you will only stand still and be silent Uh, We might interpret that as kind of a comforting phrase. It it probably is a little more uh, corrective, actually. Uh, One commentator said, shut up might be a better uh, translation. Um, It's very abrupt. It's very terse. Uh, Moses is basically saying, stop. Stop talking. Stop talking. Stop complaining. Stop doubting. Stand here and watch what God is going to do. God's expectation is always that his people would believe in his greatness. God doesn't assume that his people will doubt his greatness. He assumes that people should believe in the greatness he has revealed. He assumes that of us. He assumes that of this people. And so the Lord says to Moses, likely referring to the Israelite complaints, why do you cry to me? Tell the people to go forward. Where you see a sea, I see a road, God says. Tell the people to go forward and you will watch what I will do. God's plan is unfolding perfectly in orderly fashion. Listen, that's always the case. It's always the case that God's purposes are just proceeding exactly the way he plans for them to. God looks down at earth and he says, yes, exactly right. That's exactly what should be happening right now. Pharaoh's charging, confident and arrogant. The people look helpless. That's exactly the way I wanted it. We tend to think, this is a disaster. This is a mess. Get something together, God. Organize yourself better. Plan better. Didn't you know there's a sea here? God says, yes, I know, I know that. I know exactly what's happening. It's proceeding exactly. So he, he feels almost like an administrator who's dealing literally with children. Get up and walk forward. There's a sense of directness about God's reply, isn't there? Why do you cry to me? Do you actually think a sea is a barrier to the Lord? Do you actually think chariots matter to God? Horses matter to God? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. Oh, obviously, of course, that's what we should do. God doesn't see life through physical limitations. Since he created the seas and divided them in the first place, he sees no problem in dividing them again. Listen, it does, it does no good, I don't think, modern critical theory about the Bible uh, sort of <laughs> picks parts of the scriptures that they find most embarrassing and tries to explain how they couldn't happen. Um, I, I am not one who would recommend that practice uh, because if you try to like pick 
a particular story and say, well, we can explain uh, the supernatural nature of this one, and that makes the Bible more tenable, more uh, palatable to our modern sensibilities. Listen, the whole Bible is supernatural. (laughs) It's no good to pick the Red Sea and kind of explain it naturally. Well, it wasn't really a sea. It was sort of like a, a, a ditch with a little bit of water, and the wind kind of blew it slightly to the side. One wonders why the Egyptians were eventually drowned in such a small amount of water. But, but you could think that, well, it wasn't really a big sea. Uh, and I think, well, okay, but why bother? Why explain that and still have to deal with the resurrection? Why, why deal with the, the number of Israelites and how there couldn't have been this many and they wouldn't have fit going across this particular area if, if you still have to deal with God says he will raise every person out of their graves. They will literally fly through the air to a new heavens and a new earth that will descend out of the cosmos and come down uh, where it's a, a city made of gold. Why bother with the crossing of the Red Sea? Listen, either the Bible is completely supernatural and God is, or it's not worth believing at all. Either God is completely all-powerful and he can do anything like stopping the sun or raising the dead or crossing the Red Sea and, and, and conquering the powers of this age, or, or he's not worth believing at all. It's no good trying to create this, this easy Christianity that, that explains something scientifically as a way of making the rest of the Bible more palatable. Look, Christianity is supernatural or it's not Christianity. God is all-powerful or he's not worth following. The Bible proclaims him as the all-powerful God. What he declares to Moses is nothing short of a supernatural event. It is an occasion that is only taking place because God rules over the laws of physics and nature. This is not a coincidence. This is not something that happened accidentally and has become a myth and a legend. No, to believe in the Bible, you have to believe that the God who created the heavens and the earth literally did the impossible, divided a sea, and caused people to walk through on dry ground. God's plans are unfolding exactly as he wants them to. But you notice a change beginning in verse 19. God stops directing and he starts acting. He involves himself now in the narrative. God's power, we might label this next section. Verse 19, then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back in a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued. This is is why you have to appreciate the hardness of heart. The hard-hearted person sees evidence of the power of God and ignores it. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Now, I just want you to notice the the symbolism here. The very objects that were the symbol of Egypt's power are now a vulnerability. These heavy iron chariots that were their symbol of absolute power and dominion are now a liability because they're stuck in the mud and they can't drive heavily because God has basically come against them. Now they're stuck in the middle of the seabed with iron chariots that won't move, hitched to horses who can't pull them. God always does that. He takes precisely at the point that seems the greatest strength of his enemies and turns it into a weakness. That's exactly what happened at the cross. 
It is precisely at the point when their strength seems the strongest that becomes their weakness. You see what he did that with the the chariots here? Their, Their very point of strength is now a liability. How do they get out now? And apparently they finally realize, apparently God finally opens their eyes. There's something supernatural going on here. The Lord is fighting for his people. We need to to feel the sheer terror of this moment for the Egyptians. They have driven blindly into the middle of this cavern of water. Suddenly, their chariot wheels are breaking or they won't roll correctly. They're stuck now. And it dawns on them that the cloud that was shielding the Israelites all night and the fact that there is now a road where there was a sea must be something supernatural. And if that's the case, they are now face to face with a God who is fighting against them. And suddenly, the reality of their foolishness is revealed. Listen, at the end of the age, there will be millions of people who will have this split-second revelation. They will have seconds to realize, I've been fighting God. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, all of the host of Pharaoh that had followed him into the sea, and not one of them remained." But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The absolute military power of Pharaoh is turned to nothing in a moment. The assumption of his dominion, the arrogance of his defiance of God, and suddenly in a moment, the Egyptians know who God is. And the Israelites who had been afraid suddenly see what they were doubting. That iron chariots mean nothing to the God of heaven and earth. And this absolute judgment is simultaneously a moment of salvation. They are brought through on this road to a seashore of salvation. Their enemies are cast down in defeat. And they, in their weakness and vulnerability, are lifted up to safety. God himself has fought for them. God is their salvation. God is a wall to them on the right hand and on their left and behind them. God has destroyed their enemies. And God has rescued them for the sake of his own glory. God has displayed his absolute power in salvation and judgment. And that's the conclusion that we read in verse 30. You might label this God's conclusion. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. They saw, they believed, they feared. God has done what he said he would do. Finally, the people have been given witness to the unstoppable power of God. And they believe. They believe that he is who he says he is. They believe he has inescapable power. They believe that to defy him is to invite destruction. They believe that to trust in him is to be permanently and irrevocably made safe. They fear the Lord now rather than fearing Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not to be feared, but God is to be feared with a reverence and awe because of the greatness of his power and the certainty of his supremacy over all other powers on earth. Now this story is referenced in the New Testament as a specific parallel to our salvation in Jesus Christ. 
The same God who conquered the Egyptian army and brought his people safely to the shore of salvation also conquered the ultimate enemies of God's people and triumphed over them in Christ and put them to open shame at the great moment of our exodus achieved at the cross. Colossians 2.15 says this, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. The Exodus story is used throughout the pages of Scripture as the great paradigm of God's salvation. So that when you get to Revelation, and there's the reference at the end of the book of God's people standing on the shore of a sea and then singing the song of Moses... John is bringing back to their minds this great event and saying that's ultimately what happened in all of history. God's people were helplessly trapped by their enemies of sin, Satan, and death. And their own condemnation was the only expectation they had. But suddenly, a way was opened in the sea. They were able to go through that judgment on dry ground and come to the shore of salvation. And those who defied God and were against God were cast utterly away from him. That's the story of the Bible. It's contained in Exodus 14. But we see it in an even more spiritual and profound way when Jesus opens the way to God for those who were under his condemnation. And in the same way, that event encompassed both the judgment of God and his salvation. In that case, God's judgment and his salvation was accomplished in the same person. God's justice against his enemies and his salvation of his people were accomplished in Christ because his enemies and his people were one and the same. He crushed Christ because we were his enemies and Christ died for us because we are his people. Christ's body was cast to death and we were brought safely to salvation. That moment of redemption and safety and glory and power was a moment of presumed weakness that was actually strength. And God revealed his power in our salvation. Let me give you a few points of application. How do we respond to the absolute power of God in salvation and judgment? How do we respond? How do you respond? How do you live with the right thoughts of God in your mind? A few points. A few things we can remember. First, the wilderness of weakness is the context of God's power. Happens again and again in Scripture. It's in that moment in the wilderness. It's in that moment of limitations. It's in that moment of feeling your vulnerabilities. It's in that moment of feeling lowly and weak and despised and scorned and unable and incapable and surrounded that the Lord exercises His power. And that's true for the local church and it's true for the individual Christian. So that when you come in on a Sunday and you feel weak and lowly, that might be the exact moment God wants to use his power through you and towards you. It's true when you're witnessing to an unbeliever, when you feel incapable and unable and and ill-equipped, and that might be the exact moment God wants to use his power displayed through you. It might be for you when you're experiencing suffering or weakness. This is the God who exercises his power in the context of the wilderness of weakness. The wilderness of weakness is the context of God's powerful. Second point, God is more powerful than the chariots of temptation and slavery of sin. Pharaoh surely wanted to bring them back into slavery. No different than our former master, sin and lust and craving and the bondage that comes because of sin and our old nature in life. And it charges towards us every day, doesn't it? It charges towards us, whether you are tempted by anger or selfishness or pride or (laughs) impatience, whatever your temptation is, isn't it charged towards you every day to take you back into the slavery of that former bondage? And yet God has set us free in Christ. God declares to our former masters, no, no. 
And he teaches us to say, it's not better to be in Egypt in slavery than to be right where God wants me to be, on the shore of salvation. We are not to live under the yoke of that slavery again. And God is determined to keep us free from the bondage to our cravings. This is the same God. The same God who sits with us at our computer screens, and in our family arguments, in our conversations with our children, in our temptations at work. The same God sits with us there and teaches us to turn away from Egypt and to look to him. Third application point, God will crush the hard-hearted and defiant. Let me speak in a particular way to anybody here that is evaluating whether or not you believe in Jesus. Maybe you're a young person and you're following your parents appropriately and submitting to them and coming to church, but let me speak to you. Listen, if, if your heart is hard toward God and you stay that way, you will eventually end up like Pharaoh and his army. God is patient towards rebels, but there comes a point when chances run out and there are no chances left and there is only hard-heartedness and the God who will crush those who defy him. Look, we might be uncomfortable with thinking of God this way, but the Bible presents God this way, and we have to be true to his word. The Bible is very clear that God will crush those who defy him. He will destroy them. He will not ultimately give them an infinite number of chances to repent. He will give them many opportunities, but those opportunities will come to an end, and in the end, God will destroy those who say in their lives, who is the Lord? Please don't be one of them. Please don't be one of them. Please don't be like Pharaoh. Foolish, arrogant, self-confident, charging right into God's judgment. It's the same God who invites you to trust him that if you do not will crush you if you defy him finally God will bring his people to the shore of salvation God will bring his people to the shore of salvation though we wander in the wilderness though his directions often seem perplexing Though we're not sure why he allows certain moments of vulnerability to take place, though we often feel uncertain, we battle with doubts, we have to repent from fears, God will bring his people to the shore of salvation. He will bring us there. He will bring us there certainly and definitely and without fail. And there is no enemy either of our hearts or of this world or of the supernatural evil that exists that will be able to stop God's people from arriving on that final shore and singing that final song and exulting in the glory and power of their Lord and Savior. God will bring his people to the shore of salvation. If you are a believer and you believe in Jesus, you will be on that shore one day. You will be on that shore. God will have brought you there, and you will be able to sing a song of salvation to him. You will be able to lift your voice and declare, the Lord is my rock. The Lord is my redeemer. The Lord is the one who has rescued me. The Lord is my salvation and my king. The Lord is the one who has cast down his enemies. The Lord is the one who raised me up from the grave. The Lord is the one who suffered in my place. The Lord is the one who took the guilt of my sins, and the Lord has brought me to his eternal kingdom and shore, and I will be, I will be declaring the glory of the Lord for endless ages. And brothers and sisters, when we gather on Sunday, Sunday is sure anticipation day. It's sure anticipation day. Sunday is the day when the church practices and exalts 
in the way that they will when we're on that shore in the end. That's what we're doing on Sunday. It's sure practice day. It's day where we practice the song that we will sing when he has brought us through that devastating judgment on this earth and brought us safely home. So when we come in those doors and walk in, sit in these chairs and stand to sing, let's sing as people who are by faith standing on a shore. Let's sing as people who have been brought through the sea of condemnation safely. Let's sing as people who have seen the rock and the Savior suffer for our sins and who, has, who have seen the enemies of our soul destroyed. Let's sing and celebrate and listen and anticipate. This is sure anticipation day. So when you're coming to church on Sunday, anticipate God. Anticipate singing to God. Anticipate celebrating God. Anticipate the glory of God, the greatness of God, the power of God. Anticipate God. We were made for the shore. And every time we gather, we're a little closer. Let's pray. Let me invite Juan to come up. I guess to sing that song, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord Jesus, you are our rock. Apart from you, we would have been cast into the mire and the devastation of your judgment. Our greatest emblems of strength would be shown to be our weakness. Our greatest boasts would be our greatest shame. But Lord, instead you have brought us safely through your judgment. And Lord, we stand by faith now on that shore that one day we will see. We declare there is no one like you. We want to anticipate you. We want to exult in you. We want to sing this song of deliverance. You have fought for us. Receive the glory, we pray. In Jesus' name.